I'm guessing that maybe only a few of you are old enough to remember the anti-drug campaign that was particularly big when I was in high school. Uh, this is the, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. So we're going to be watching the brain on drugs video. Um, and you might be thinking, why in the heck does this pertain to proteins? Well, I want you to watch as the egg gets fried in this video and to recognize that this is like the penultimate example of protein denaturation. What I want you to look for is I want you to look for the qualities in the egg that change as the the um, brain is fried. It really was. It really was a great campaign. Uh, so let's let's remember as we go into this next section, the video showing the egg getting fried and what was happening during protein denaturation. Now let's define protein denaturation because it's tempting to think that denaturation is literally the conversion of our fully folded protein. And here I've got our model again, taking that fully folded protein and like completely unfolding it and making it into the linear form. And while sometimes that does happen in protein denaturation, oftentimes, more often, it is just enough loss in structure to cause a loss in function, and it may not be complete unfolding to a linear chain. We can write that down and just say that denaturation is a disruption. Uh, it's a disruption in the proton confir conformation, enough of which will lead to a inactivation or a complete loss of functioning. And as I mentioned, may or may not involve complete unfolding, but it's certainly enough of a disruption to take away the function. We have a couple of types of uh, or methods, shall we say, of denaturation. One of those is what you just saw in the Brain on Drugs video, and that is thermal denaturation, using heat to cause proteins to lose enough of their structure to stop working. We can do this in a much more controlled environment than the frying pan. For example, we could take a protein, put it in an aqueous solution, and we could put it in a quartz cuvette, for example, and put it into a UV vis spectrophoto spectrophotometer and monitor the change in this, changes in absorbance as we change gradually the heat that is applied to the sample. So we can change the temperature, gradually increasing it, but at the same time that we do that, we actually simultaneously have to mix in a reducing agent. And that reducing reagent has the express purpose of breaking disulfide linkages. That is, we need to break those cystine bonds between the neighboring disulfide or between the neighboring cysteine residues that do form those disulfide linkages. A good example of a reducing reagent that could make this possible is called beta mercaptoethanol or 2 mercaptoethanol. So if we mix that in to the UV vis cuvette while we're gradually ra raising the temperature, that will break the disulfide linkages, then an allowing a relaxation enough of the protein structure to eventually lead to a change in, in prote protein function. Protein structure is monitored consistently through this UV absorbent, and the graph that we're seeing below is, is the graph that will allow us to see that change. But I want to come back to our brain on drugs video, because remember that what happened to the egg as it was being fried was multifold. One, we saw a change in the the overall transparency of the egg. Remember how the white of the egg when frying began was, was transparent. And as is the protein denatured, there was a change from it being transparent to being completely opaque. So UV absorbance was changing in, in that and optical rotation uh, as a property was changing. Also, recall that the viscosity changed. The egg as, as it was being fried went from being very viscous to being very, very firm. So that's another property that could be a representation of protein denaturation. So in this graph, notice that on the y-axis we're looking at the fraction unfolded and on the x-axis we're looking at the temperature. And you notice the sigmoidal curve that takes place with a sort of a vertical plateau and we see that it goes from being 
uh, no a zero percent unfolded to being fully 100 percent unfolded in this controlled process and at the 50 percent mark is where I've drawn out a hashed line to represent that the point at which 50 percent um, the protein is 50 percent unfolded is defined as the TM or melting temperature of the protein so I'm just going to jot that down that TM stands for melting temperature and that term is very commonly used not only when we're talking about protein melting temperature but also when we talk about DNA melting temperature which can also be monitored in the same way and looking for the point at which the protein is 50 percent denatured that is our melting temperature it's interesting to note that for eukaryotic proteins this happens at a temperature of about 50 to, to 60 degrees Celsius that is to say that most of our proteins, enzymes, whatnot, do not like temperatures that exceed 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. This is about approximately 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you think about it, that's not that hot. I mean, this is maybe 12 degrees-ish or so <clears throat> over the temperature of a really hot, hot tub. So it's a temperature that we would not want most, most of our proteins to spend extended period of time and certainly one at which they begin to stop functioning. But it's interesting to know that there, is, there are many life forms out there for which this is not the case. And you'll think back, those of you who took micro, to archaeal proteins and thermophilic bacterial proteins. For example, that from Thermus aquaticus where we isolate the ever famous enzyme called TAC, which is a polymerase that, that functions at very, very hot temperatures. So depending upon the life form, this TM may be very different. But for most eukaryotic proteins, we can answer that question with 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, which does answer the bottom question down here in approximately what temperature range generally is the TM. Depends, again, on the nature of the life from which that protein was isolated. So let's just jot down that the TM or melting temperature does depend upon the pH or ionic strength of the solution. That makes sense to us because we recognize that protein unfolding will potentially be triggered by changes in the protonation or ionization state of the amino acids, the R groups of the amino acids, and recognizing how much of an impact that might make on overall tertiary interactions. And that can likewise then have a large impact on when that melting temperature takes place. So thermal denaturation, one way in which proteins can be denatured, but not the only way. And in fact, more commonly in lab, we use chemicals to denature proteins. One of those such chemicals is guanidinium hydrochloride. We talked a little bit about this before because these are kaotropes. And kaotropes do something pretty awesome. They actually increase the chaos of water. So by increasing the chaos or the disorder of water, they allow water to interdigate into places in the protein that they wouldn't normally get and by doing that they get into these hydrophobic reaches of the protein and allow the protein to be more likely to denature so they salivate the hydrophobic regions in the interior of the protein causing that relaxing of the tertiary structure and the loss of the overall function the other type of reagent that can be used to do this is the the detergent and detergents do this in a slightly different way by penetrating the protein interior and they actually interrupt hydrophobic interactions um, due to interactions with that hydrophobic uh, tail so it's the light dissolves like uh, idea as opposed to the increasing of water chaos idea so this is doing in in a sense the same thing but doing it in a slightly different way this is actually not that hard to do in the lab. Any of you could do it. You can take your protein, you put it in, for example, a falcon tube, you add into that falcon tube your guanidinium hydrochloride, put it in a dark drawer, sit it in there over lunch, and your protein will begin to denature. So it's certainly not a very difficult process. But what is really cool is that if you take your kaotrope, you add in simultaneously your reducing reagent to get rid of the disulfide linkages. So you add in tumor ethanol, guanidinium hydrochloride, put it in a dark drawer, allow the protein to denature, and then you take your protein and simultaneously dialyze away both the reducing reagent and the denaturing reagent, your protein, get this, get this, your protein will re 